You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications button so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. You've done a very bold earner where you try to do an earner where you, the, the Sultan of Brunei, he was the richest man in the world at that time. That's right, yes. You decided to pretend to be his brother, phone the jewellers in Beverly Hills, organise limousines, SCS guards, the full works to meet those people and for a two million pound scam. I've hired a lady, I've hired a lady, it's cost us 150 grand, yeah, uh, off a banker's credit card um, from uh, Belgium. And um, the lady, because uh, we're thinking, I'm thinking if you're on the other side, yeah, you, and you, you, you get shopping for the prince, you know, expense is, is nothing, you know what I mean? We flew the lady over, and in my, in my eyes, I'm thinking, there's greed from them side, them as well, and us, because they're thinking, commission. The next day, I said to him, I made him catch a train up to Leeds, not Manchester. Drove up to Leeds, got got a parcel, went to a secure location, opened it. Mate, fuck me. <laughs> Man, you needed sunglasses. It's shiny as them teeth. <laughs> there was a necklace in there, um, which was worth, this was probably the biggest item, which was worth half a million. You know, four-sided diamonds, but the clarity, you know, amazing. Honest to God, mate. I'll never forget that. <laughs> you know. You have to take a moment there. Yeah, because, you know, it's, it's, it was 21 years ago and, you know, talking about it and looking, well, it just brings it back. Boom, we're on. Yeah. And today's guest, we've got Saqib. How are you, brother? I'm good, mate. I'm good. It's good to have you on. Mate, I've been, been waiting. I couldn't wait to come on, mate. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. I've seen all your stuff in Vice. You've done a very bold earner, where you try to do an earner, where you, the, the Sultan of Brunei, he was the richest man in the world at that time. That's right, yes. You decided to pretend to be his brother, phone the jewellers in Beverly Hills, organised limousines, SCS guards, the full works to meet those people and for a £2 million scam. Um, fair play to you. Very out there, very Ocean's Eleven kind of thing. So, very interesting. I've seen your videos on Vice. I know they've just went out recently, Facebook, YouTube. I was like, I need to get this man on. It's, um, obviously, this is my show is quite anything goes. It's kind of this sort of stuff that people love. So, how's things, first of all? Yeah, good, thank you, mate. You know, Good, you know, especially with this COVID situation, it's good to be healthy, you know, um, and safe. Yeah, behaving. Always. Good stuff. Yeah. I always go back to the start with my guests, where you grew up and how it all began. Right, well, um, not far from here. It was uh, about three miles away, Cheetah Mill. It's, uh, in the 80s, it was notorious for uh, gangs uh, with uh, fights with Moss Side. Um, but where I grew up, when we grew up, it was... Uh, it was a working class area, um, quite Asian um, populated. And um, growing up, uh, it was a really good time, to be honest with you. you good know. parents and stuff. Yeah, yeah. My father came over in, I'd say, in the 60s. He, he worked, you know, all his life, um, you know, uh, working hard, to be honest with you. Never, ever got in trouble with the police. So... Uh, you made up for that. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, unfortunately I did, yeah, yeah, yeah. How was your schooling? Schooling, yeah, uh, well, well, I went to a local school, um, went to um, secondary school not far uh, from Cheetahville, and uh, went to college, and uh, from there, that's where we started to be mischievous. What were you doing at college? Uh, business, business and finance, would you yeah. believe? Yeah. yeah, try to go legit. Well, you, that's it. Or just try to learn the trade. Well, just listen, you know, everyone thinks they're going to be a good, you know, Big businessman, so why yeah. Not? yeah. So you kind you, you get into fraud and stuff at the start. What was the kind of the start of your criminal activities? Well, it was from about eighteen um, uh, when we started college. Um, we um, there was a foreign student in my class, and uh, we basically scammed his identity 
you know, in them days, you used to have an NUS card, a library card, and su- such as, and we changed the address to a Cheetamil address where we had access to, and uh, opened a, a, a bank account. Um, and um, I got my mate. He was a bit. He looked a bit more mature at the time. And uh, we we got um, a credit card. And in them days, there used to be checkbooks, and um, we just went shopping. And uh, even. To be honest with you, when we were getting stuff in them days, it was just like for us and our mates, like, you know, a pair of trainers and, you know, it wasn't a case of, yeah, we'll sell it on. It was just for us. Yeah. What did you do after that? Was that the kind of the start of it? Did that? Yeah. It's, yeah. Well, we started to get into it. And then mm-hmm. what happened was um, a few years into it, I got lucky. Um, we met a girl in in a snooker club and um, I got chatting to just small talk and, she worked for American Express, and we were already doing credit cards. And we thought, this is this is our access into the big league, because uh, at that time, American Express, um, if you had American Express card, you was naturally a big player. Um, so um, got to know her, got speaking to her, didn't obviously tell her, didn't want to scare her off what we was doing. Got her confidence and uh, wind and dined her a little bit, and then uh, started to steadily get information. So you're getting like bank details, people's yeah. information where you could, was it telephone bank then or was it, no, it well, stuff uh, dropped off to addresses? Yeah, 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 pretty much. It was, um, American Express is worldwide, so you could ring up Brazil with a certain amount of information and then you'd you'd gain some more information off them, such as a spending pattern and stuff. And um, once you, it's like a jigsaw, once you had it all together, um, I mean, let's say it was yourself, I'd have, at hand, I'd have probably more information that you'd know, you know from your national insurance, maybe even your passport number, uh, how much you're spending, and then uh, we'd, uh, we'd go. What know. kind of money were you making back then? Well, to be honest with you, when we first started, it wasn't money, it was it was more possessions and things that we wanted. It's only them, you know, as you graduate, you think, wait a minute, we can earn off this. It's not, you know, how many pairs of trainers and, you know, phones you can have. Yeah. So that's when we started to uh, look into um, anything, anything that was in the market. I remember I remember one time we got some, uh, do you remember the micro, uh, micro tap phones, the flips? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we'd order like 50 or 100 um, courier, get them sent, get someone to pick them up and then basically flood Manchester. With them. And just sell them? Yeah, yeah. Well, we, a lot of the times, to be honest with you, gave them away. It was, well, give them a lot, a lot, a lot of that. To be honest with you, but um, sell them to shops because everyone's out there to make a buck. You know, how, how many were you involved at that time? Well, it used to vary. There was mainly like two of us, and then we'd bring in different people. In you know, because it went on for years. You know, you lose friends, you gain friends, and uh, so you would, you'd call them soldiers. You know. So to do certain things, uh, but they wouldn't know the full information. It'd be like, uh, maybe go and pick something up, the smaller jobs, basically. Yeah. Um, and then, um, pretty much, to be honest with you, people kind of like had an inkling that we were doing something, mm-hmm. you know, because we, we it's hard to hide, you know, when, you, when you're driving around in nice cars and watches and whatever. Yeah, it's difficult as well, because everybody wants a wee piece of the pie. Well, this is it, and uh, being from Cheetah Mill, uh, you have to be careful because there's a lot of dangerous uh, people about yeah. and us being non-violent people. Um, so you have to kind of like, I mean, I was lucky. Um, there was uh, a guy uh, from Cheetah uh, Mill called Aki, not Purple Aki, <laughs> um, but he's, um, he's, well, he's passed away now. Um, but um, he was uh, quite a notorious person. I think he was killed by... Uh, um, the guy from Stockport, um, Aaron Coglin, um, over a dispute, and uh, he had my back. So I kind of like we were kind of like strutting around Cheetah Mill. We knew this guy's got our back, so uh, no one else could touch us. Mm-hmm. Um, a bit of protection. You giving them money or anything? No, no, not money. But you know, obviously, like. Uh, maybe a nice watch or something, you know, um, to keep him happy. It wasn't costing us anything yeah. at the time. Mm-hmm. So what kind of stuff after, like, oh, when you started ordering phones, did you go move up higher? Did you get money at any point? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, one time, um, 
we was in uh, France and uh, we decided to withdraw some money out in the bank, which is very rare because the thing is we never really wanted to show our faces or we, a lot of the time we were sending chauffeurs or drivers or couriers. So this time um, we had uh, Mr. Al Fired's details, yeah? Uh, this was before you had Harrods and everything else. And we didn't realise at the time it was highly fired. It was his ex-wife. And um, so, again, we've got dressed up. I've got my mate to front it because he looked older. And we've gone in uh, to the bank to withdraw. I think in them days it was 20,000 francs. And uh, the manager now comes out and I'm thinking, this, they're looking at us and they seem concerned. So, we, you know... What's the issue? And uh, he goes, sir, we we have issue. This uh, this card is uh, is a lady's card. So it's, this is like thinking on the spot. I turn around and say, well, don't you understand? In our Islamic law, we don't let our women come into the bank. I don't mm. apologize. Oh, we're so sorry, sir. We're so sorry. Give us the money. And the thrill of that, mate. You know, you can't beat it. But twenty thousand francs in them days. I mean, I don't know what the equivalent is mm -hmm. now, but. Uh, yeah, very rarely would you want to, you know, front it because you're in danger, aren't you? If you're yeah. in, you know, something goes like that, you could have easily gone the other way mm -hmm. and you're arrested and, and that's it. When was the first time you got caught for that? Well, well, 97 mm -hmm. uh, was the main, you know, the heist. Uh, Is but, that the first time you'd been well, caught? <clears throat> no, to be honest with you, I was caught once before, right at the beginning, um, and that was due to... Uh, with a friend of mine, uh, he got caught and he panicked and he gave my name in. So I had to do a bit of community service. Um, and then from that, from years, well, till up to 97. So mm -hmm. we're talking probably 88, 89. So, um, um, and there was another, luckily for me again, uh, where my mates, uh, they were in Holland and they were going to get some watches and stuff. And, uh, it was it was really big. It was on the TV and that because they they got arrested as the, they were going to take off. They stopped the plane and took them off. Uh, but I was I wasn't there, luckily, so I got I got away with that one. Mm -hmm. And then ninety seven was the main one, obviously. Yeah. yeah. So you are going through the ranks, just wanting more and more and more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you, you become greedy. That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. To be honest with you, you know. Yeah. Starts off maybe with a pair of trainers and a few cell phones. Yeah, Next yeah, you're, well, yeah. you're dressing up as well, a prince. We was, we was like uh, regarding as a uh, bit like Robin Hood. To be honest, with you, around our area, because you know we, we was getting it, and there was obviously not everyone was poor, but we was handing it out a lot, you know. Uh, but at the same time, it was greed totally. Yeah. yeah. And there's always victims as well. Do you know yeah. what I mean? There's always victims as well. So in the ninety seven heist, what was your before you planned the two million heist? What was what was the lead up to this? Were you just wanting more? You want to keep pushing yeah, the we, boundaries? Yeah, yeah, that was it. You know, we was you know. Were you comfortable then? Did you have money? Prior yeah, yeah, to cause, it? yeah. Because what we uh, what we got onto was getting watches. Uh, what we realised was the watches with like say a Rolex that was ten thousand or twenty thousand. You know, you'd get a good markup on it because the jewellers had. The local jewellers would buy it, mate, and put it in the shop, and you know, without yeah. any papers or anything. No, with the papers. Oh, you had yeah, the papers. Yeah, you have to, yeah, because you, you got to have the papers. Yeah. Um, with, without the papers, then the watch, watch isn't worth yeah. much. So, um, and then we realised, oh right, okay, this is where you, instead of phones and trainers to track, tra sorry, mm -hmm. to track suits, it's um, you know, this is where we can make good money, um, thousands. Yeah, what kind of watches? Rolexes, Cartiers. Daytoners, mm -hmm. a lot of Rolexes were the the ones in demand. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, in them days, you didn't have the Jacobs and whatnot, but Rolexes were the good sellers. Yeah. So, 97 then, one of the biggest heists, you've, well, the biggest heist you've done, but very well known now with a two top million heist. Yeah. In, the, in them days, it was in the top 10. So, how do you go from trying to scam the banks to then dressing up to try and scam? A jewellers, was that not a bit out there where you think, because your face is going to be seen, because the CCTV and stuff was out then? It was, but our face wasn't seen, you see. The only person that got seen was the prince. Mm -hmm. um, and then, uh, so that was one person. Um, and the second person to be seen was uh, um, the guy who basically snitched on us. Um, he, he, first of all, 
he went to Woolworths in uh, Manchester, which was literally round the corner for where I live. And uh, they they keep the CCTV for extra few months because it's cheetah mill. And uh, when they did their uh, investigations, because they had a big team looking out for us, um, they realised, right, OK, we've, we've got this picture of the prints and then we've got this phone that's been bought in Woolworths. And um, with phones, once you're ringing people, you know, they realise, right, OK, um, the phone calls... Uh, what happened was, sorry... The prince rang me off his own phone because the battery ran out and that was a link to Manchester and the Woolworths realised uh, uh, they had the footage of the kid who um, um, later on got caught with the one piece of jewellery that ever got caught was uh, a £90,000 watch in his loft with a with a newspaper cutting of the heist <laughs> <laughs> saying, <laughs> saying the, the Sultan of Sting because mm-hmm. at that time no one even knew you know, and I think it was like you had Brinks Matt at the top and we were seventh in, mm-hmm. in them days. And it's always disputed, you know, like you say two million. It, 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 from my depositions, it's always been disputed from five to two million. Yeah. Uh, no one really knows, to be honest mm-hmm. with you. So how did the idea of that come about to then pretend to be the Sultan? Was he the richest man on the planet at that time? He was the richest man in the world. What did, what did he do? He was well probably fraud. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Well, he's he's born into it, royalty. Um, so he was born into it. I mean, he he lived such a lavish lifestyle. Like he'd he'd be like, he'd get Michael Jackson at his son's wedding and stuff like that. You know, mm. I mean, just like the Saudi Arabs now. You know, the rich ones. Um, so um, what we realised is we was looking uh, at the shop. Bijan in Beverly Hills and we found out that the prince had been there a few months before so we thought right okay let's let's use this um so it took weeks and weeks because in them days it was difficult you couldn't just type someone's name on the internet and it'd come up it, everything would be phone calls reading and um, we we got these over the years we found out there was these books out I don't think they're doing now they're called like um what would they call now um who's who in the Arab world, yeah? And in that, in them books, it'd say what they're worth, where they live. It actually gives certain information, mm. which was gold, you know. And they weren't cheap to buy in them days either. They were like £70 a book. So we had a f- few of them books, and then you, you'd get all the glossy magazines, Hello, and stuff like that. And you, you'd just read. You'd have to read and, f- and phone calls. Um, and, I mean, we were stuck, we were stuck in, a, in a flat in Manchester, for about six weeks to, to actually, fi- you know, finally, you know, coming through with it. Mm-hmm. You know, people see, you know, the amount, over the years, the amount of times people say, oh, mate, you know, it was, it was easy in them days. And I say to him, no, mate, it was it was even harder, yeah. you know. Um, Less information. That's right, mm-hmm. yeah. Had to work as hard. So, talk me right through from day one, right through till you get busted. Day one, um, like I said, I was flicking through magazines, mm-hmm. uh, Board, flicking through magazines, see read um, that Bijan, you know this exclusive shop. How much were they saying he was worth? Who the Sultan of Brunei? Yeah. It, it, Millions. Yeah, you. I mean, they couldn't even say. Much is he still the richest? Or is it the? Uh, well, again, you know, Arabs and stuff. Yeah, I mean, it probably still is to be honest with you, because that that wealth, you, you, it's not you can't even count it. Is he still alive? You know what? I think recently, I don't know. One of them, someone's died recently. Do I, to be honest, I don't keep in touch with right. him. <laughs> Do you think he would have heard about it? Probably not. Nah. Man. Probably not. And this is the thing you see. So when when we were doing these high flying people, yeah, like it's like let, let's say it's yourself, yeah, and you're worth five million, and fifty thousand goes out of your account. You don't even deal with your bank account, you know. So and they're gonna get reimbursed, you know. They're going to get mm-hmm. reimbursed from American Express. So, I mean, I'll tell you one thing, though, what you just mentioned there. We had a choice of running a trial. Um, and at that time, because what we did was when we did it, you had the heist and then you had, we drank up a jewellers in Australia and Singapore. So it's like, which one comes through first? And when we rang, um, when we rang these other countries up in Australia, you're going to laugh, yeah? We went back to, we ordered like, 
nine pairs of Timberland trainers and then you're ordering these diamonds there that are worth millions. So we thought, right, okay, we've got a choice. If you run a trial, this is going to cost the taxpayer millions, yeah, because it's all these different countries and then they're going to come going to come and have to give evidence. So run a trial, you get found guilty, you're going to get slammed even worse. Um, and at that time, my QC was um, one of the top five in England, Jonathan Goldberg, and uh, we decided, because I knew at that time it would have ended, ended up being a cutthroat defence. You're blaming me, um, he's blaming him, and we're all going to go, we're going to get slammed. And if you don't throw in a guilty, you're not going to get the credit of your sentence. So we ended up, thought, right, OK, we'll throw our hands in. Um, and, and that's why I did, well, I got three and a half mm -hmm. years and did... How many people were involved? <clears throat> well, those. I'd say six, and there was only f three of us that did a sentence, and three, uh, well, were never to be seen. So 50% of you get done? Yeah, yeah. So but them three, well, to be honest with you, was they didn't pay major roles, and I thought to myself, there's no point in sinking the whole ship. You know, I wasn't going to dob someone else in, you know, even though I was feeling the heat of the kid who got caught in Woolworths. Mm -hmm. So he stuck, basically stuck everyone in? Yeah, yeah, he's, I mean, because what happened was they got remanded first, uh, two of them. You got the prince and you got the kid who got caught with the phone and the piece of jewellery. So he's banged to rights, yeah. So we was getting messages across, because he's from Cheetah Mill, you know. We've kind of like grew up together. Because um, when you're going to do something like this, you're not just going to bring someone else in. You've got to, you know, you got to kind of like know Mm -hmm. uh, but then again, you know, you just don't know how people will react when the when the shit is a fan under pressure, and you, yeah, you've yeah, seen yeah, it yeah. through the years. That yeah, yeah. It's, it's, these so-called tough men and bad men, they're the first ones that their asses claps. Well, James, the thing is, we've never claimed to be tough men, yeah. Mm -hmm. But on the day we knew, and I knew, if if you're gonna get into this business somewhere down the line, you're gonna end up doing bird, yeah. And, you know, we're not talking 20 years, 30 years. We're talking a few years and you're out. And if you can't handle that, then maybe, yeah. you know, you're better off getting it. It's all part and parcel of the business, though, That's isn't right, it? yeah. So when you're done then, you started looking into the Sultan, you realised, OK, this, yeah, this so can happen. So how did it, what was the steps to eventually the day it happened? Oh, mate, we hardly slept, yeah. Hardly slept. With excitement? Or? Yeah, yeah, of course, of course. Because what it was is, the thing is, we never spoke about money. Yeah, when you're the richest man, you're not gonna ask, you know, um, how much is this piece gonna be? We we in a, we were quite sure that it's gonna be millions, you know, because when we used to speak to him over the phone, we used to say, look, we want the best of the best, the best gradient, you know, the VVSs and everything else. And um, leading up to it, again, because we were talking to different countries as well. Um, Again, we was on Singapore, Australia, the Bears in Australia, we was on the phone to them. And then we realised this is the one, this is the one that's going to come through. So we started to neglect them, apart from the Timberland, they'd already come. Um, so, oh my, honestly, even now when I think about the excitement, because <laughs> what you're thinking is, we've hired a lead yet, I've hired a lead yet, it's cost us 150 grand, yeah, uh, off a banker's credit card. Um, from uh, Belgium and um, the Learjets because uh, we're thinking I'm thinking if you're on the other side yeah you, and you, you you're shopping for the prints you know expense is, is nothing you know what I mean we flew the Learjet over and in my in my eyes I'm thinking there's greed from them side them as well and those because they're thinking commission you know so the Learjet flies over, picks them up. Uh, we've hired, we've already, uh, we're not sure now. When they land, we, we're kind of like winging it as well. We're not sure whether to meet them because we, none of us want to meet them, you know, right mm. face to face. Um, and we're thinking, what do we do here? Let's try and get them up to Manchester because we're lazy as well. We're thinking, mm. you know what? So I've rang up Manchester United, yeah? And I uh, said, uh, look, uh, the Sultan of Brunei is thinking of coming over to watch a game and, and uh, 
he wants a box. You know, to entertain him. So I entertain him, get mm-hmm. the box and do one while they're watching the game. And even now, if you Google Manchester United and, you know, you Google famous people that have wanted to watch United and stuff, the Sultan of Rai, Brunei comes up, but it was me. So um, at the time we're playing it, I'm thinking, oh, and then it clicked because, like I said, we've had, over the years, we've had different people come and do stuff with us. And uh, one of my best mates, um, he lived in London, in Slough. So I thought, you know what? And I trusted him because the thing is, if you're going to, parcel like that you just don't want anyone picking you up it's not like say it was you you pick you up and then you t- say turn around to you know what fuck off do yeah. one. you know what I mean I can't call the police can I mm-hmm. you know I'd have to ring that okay. <laughs> but um <clears throat> so yeah um as we're mulling and we're thinking what should we do should we drive down because we're fucked you know we've this is weeks of in this apartment um making phone calls reading research and the excitement, you know what I mean? We, we, we've, we're mm-hmm. knackered. And uh, so I thought, I've clicked. I go, you know what? Let me ring my guy. So I ring him and I said, look. And over the years, he'd done stuff with us anyway. He knew what he was into, but it was never millions, you know? So I never mentioned, again, I didn't mention money either. Mm-hmm. I said, look, get dressed up, get, you know, presentable and go to the airport. You're going to get picked up. Hired seven limousines, yeah? He gets picked up. And then um, at the same time, what we did was, these are the little details you see. When they land, what's there? A limousine for them with flowers coming from. Um, so he gets picked up. They go to the Sheraton where they were. And at the same time, we're, we're talking to them. They've, they've had a lovely meal the night before. Everything's come. How many of them were so from America? And, woman. and they never questioned anything? Well... You g- Did they, they not have security fuck? with them? No. With the jeweller either? No, no, mate. Could you not have just fucking took it off them when they were coming out the airport? Well, again... Like a snack, a grab and... St- yeah, the, the thing is, we would... I was thinking ahead in the sense that we don't want to... There's no way we're going to commit mm-hmm. violence, but we still want the jeweller. Yeah. You know, because um, once you get into stuff like that, you get, you're looking at big jail, you know. Uh, whereas fraud is a white collar crime, yeah. and um, so to be honest with you, we we weren't willing to, you know, go go that way. Mm-hmm. Um, we've never never been violent before, and we wasn't going to start now. So when they've been winding and dying, the next day they met at the Sheraton. Seven limousines pull up. He's in the in the middle. There's an SAS bodyguard that's been hired who's not got a clue. You know um, what's going on regarding the fraud, and uh, he was a bit of a unit as well. So, what's happened? He sat in the car, we're on the phone to him, and said, "Around what's going on?" Because they're not sure what's happening either. Mm-hmm. You know, because again, like I said, this is where we're playing it by ear. So um, I said to Ryan, "What's going on?" They go, oh, "They've got this parcel." I said, so, "Right, well, tell the bodyguard to go over and tell him that you you want to view it." in private at the Dorchester because I think he, he owned I think he owned the Dorchester or well, that's where he used to stay when he used to come over so now this is where in the court papers they've turned around and says the bodyguard the SAS bodyguard has gone over they were reluctant to give him the bag and he snatched it mate why is he going to snatch a bag off him you know he's just there doing his job you know there's no way he snatched the bag they give it to him but to cover to cover their backsides They've turned around and says, the bodyguard snatched it, passed it to my mate. He's cool as a cucumber, sat in the bloody limousine. So I'm like, right, what's going on? He goes, we're parked up. I go, you got the parcel? He goes, yeah. I'm going to tell the chauffeur to drive off. As he's drove off, um, I'm talking, right, where are you now? You know, he goes, right, you know, we've got, we're a bit away. So I go, that's when I think... This is what's happened. The chauffeur, yeah, he's only got a bladder problem, right? He needs a wee. So he, he's, he's asked uh, my mate, do you mind excuse himself to go to the toilet? So, so I, I don't know exactly what's going on. All I know is he's sat in the back of the limousine. He's away. I know he's got a parcel. So I'm, I'm a bit, bit more relaxed. So listen, what's going on? He goes, oh, the chauffeur's uh, gone for a piss. And go, what are you doing? 
because I'm sat in the fucking limousine. I go, mate, get the fuck out of there. Get out of there and do one. He's got out, legged it to the tube and gone home. And uh, that was that. The jewellery's vanished, mate. Is uh, the next day I said to him, I made him catch a train up to Leeds, not Manchester. Drove up to Leeds, got got the parcel, went to a secure location, opened it, mate. Fuck me, <laughs> man! You need sunglasses. It's shiny as them teeth. <laughs> and that was that, mate. Yeah, well, I said to him, I "Go look," because I knew he will definitely get a knock on the door. You know, because there would be some. And from the air, from the airport, there's some yeah. camera footage, not major. You know, it was not like now where you've got cameras everywhere. So I, f- I had a feeling he would get a knock mm. on the door. So when they le- they left the limo, yeah. without the the package, or did they take it into the hotel? Who uh, the, the the jailers from LA? No, it, well, what happened is they've they've arrived the night before. Mm-hmm. Uh, they've been shipped to the hotel. They've been well, no one's there, but they've. Everything's calm. They've had meals, wine, whatever, relaxed. And they're probably thinking, wow, you know, mm-hmm. we're quids in, you know, flown over by a private jet. Um, so next morning they've got up and uh, that's when the, the shit hit the fan, as they say. Because um, we was on, obviously on the phone to him saying, look, yeah. you know, he's coming, you know. He, and uh, again, because we were playing it by ear at the time as well, we didn't give him that much information. Did they ever get to meet the f- fake prince? No, not physically. Good. I mean, only from, well, let's mm-hmm. say they're, they're at the front of the hotel. He's in, in one of the limousines. So they probably didn't even see him. So they've pulled up with a limousine, all the limousines there. Seven limousines. And they think, okay, the prince is there. Who did they speak to at the hotel? Well, or was it just all phone calls? All, all phone calls, bro. And they fell for that hook, line and sinker. Mate, yeah, but look, <laughs> this is it, you see. It's, it's greed. Uh-huh. You know, it's greed uh-huh. from them as well, mm-hmm. you know. But if you're getting, listen, if you're in a private plane, you're just thinking, you're not thinking this exactly, is a setup. Exactly, exactly. And this is going That's on. That's the thing that's probably sealed it. It's gone, gone on for weeks, brother. Mm-hmm. I mean, I t- there was a time, um, yeah, <laughs> I remember the, uh, the rang, because uh, we had a phone, yeah, uh, another page you go phone, and um, we says, we, obviously we was in the, the flat and I ran in the kitchen, I've turned the extractor hood on and I says, I'm on a satellite phone, I'm on the on an aeroplane, you know. There was a time when they've, because we had, I mean, I've got, in my depositions, it's got the prince's palace's number, but um, if you're going to ring that number, you're not going to get through to the prince, you're going to get through to your secretary. And they'd ring and then we'd ring them back, say, you know, this has went on for weeks. You know, so I think by the time they got on the plane, they thought, you know, everything's mm. everything's kosher. When did they put the red flags up when the limo drove away? Well, <clears throat> this is it. Um, from what I know, um, they started. Uh, no, that's okay. No, that's okay. Uh, they started. Uh, well, so, as soon as they drove off, they thought, wait a minute. You know, they stood there. These limousines have drove off. You know, that's when. They, but the bodyguard, SAS bodyguard, was with them. You know, so they started shouting, apparently shouting at him, and he's like, "I'm doing my job." So uh, that's when um, I think they rang the chauffeur. One of the other chauffeurs is rang the chauffeur who went for a leak, and by that time everything's gone, mate. You know, mm-hmm. he's pissing his pants, and we're laughing our way. Yeah. yeah. So that was that between two and five mil. Was it a briefcase? Opened it up. What kind of stuff was in it? <sighs> what? Like your watch there, mm-hmm. but encrusted with diamonds. Everything was the, the bet. I mean, honestly, God. Uh, there was a necklace in there, um, which was worth, this was probably the biggest item, which was worth half a million. You know, four sided diamonds, but the clarity, you know, amazing. Honestly, God, mate. I'll never forget that. <laughs> you know. You have to take a moment now. Yeah, because, you know, it's, it's, it was 21 years ago and, you know, talking about it and looking, well, it just brings it back. Um, I'm not doing it justice. All I can tell you, it was amazing. You had everything in it, sapphires, rubies, um, necklaces. I mean, there's, there's about 18 pieces and it, 
Yeah. The cheapest one was about, well, the watch that I give to the kid, his coat, that was 90 grand. And that's the only thing that was ever found. Mm -hmm. So even though in that life of crime, you know yourself, everybody's greedy. Were you thinking I could have got more? What kind of stuff, what was the most expensive stuff thing in that jewellers at that time, do you know? Yeah, the necklace that was oh, half. So yeah. they brought that anyway? Yeah, 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 mm -hmm. yeah. The, oh, what well, the thing is, um, they could have bought half the shop, you know. Um, like I said to you, it's always disputed. And the reason it's disputed is because when they landed, I said to him, I go, look, because again, I was thinking ahead. I said to him, look, uh, customs going to come onto the plane. I, didn't, I said, don't declare the goods because then we're going to have to pay heavy tax on it. So again, greed on their part. Mm -hmm. They didn't. That's why it's disputed. It, I've read from 2 point, like I said to you, 2.5 to $5 million it was. Mm -hmm. It's what happened to the two people. Did, did they get sacked? To be honest, yeah, you know, I don't know. Or did they show up at court or anything? This is it, mate. Didn't need to, you know, because at the end of the day, I thought to myself, I thought long and hard, I thought, if you run a trial, it's good. It is going to cost the taxpayer millions, yeah. Because, and first of all, it's gonna, it was already in the papers. Imagine the Sultan of Brunei. The Sultan of Brunei is not going to come to England to give evidence, yeah, mm -hmm. you know. And I thought, because it was already in the papers, I thought, and that's why I think we've got, well, I got uh, three and a half years, because to be honest with you, uh, at that time, there was, uh, there was a guy in London and he did something not similar, but it was a big amount, two million. And the guy, but he was, uh, he was, uh, let's say, he was uh, from a rich family, and um, he he got to community service for two million. So I'm thinking, if he's getting two million, uh, for two million, he's getting community service. I I really thought I'd be getting about two years. I know people be thinking, is he taking a piss? But it's a white collar crime, no violence. No guns, you know, no weapons. No weapons. It's quite comical. I had a previous, you know, small previous. So I'd, I didn't have a record. Um, to to be fair, I had some good references. Do you, you know? get done for conspiracy fraud? Yeah, consp yeah, well, this is it, you see. You got, we got done for five counts of conspiracy to steal. Uh, and that's when, you know, obviously, when it's a conspiracy pre-planned and everything else... You're gonna get more, even though they only had one witness against you. No, well, the, no, the wit. Well, it was. Uh, yeah, the guy, your friend who stuck you in. Well, what did he get? To me, he walked. He he, oh, he 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 was on. He he was on. They were on remand before before they come to to me. So he was. Uh, he, he literally did about five months, and he walked me and. Uh, and the prince walked um, because I I turned around and said, "Look, you had nothing to do with it." Um, again, if you're going down, why take you know? Yeah. Take everyone with you, and uh, and to be fair to him, he he did it as a favor to me. Obviously, he knew there was something dodgy because over the years he'd been with us. But um, you know, again, he did six months, and he walked. was he dressed up. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <you know. laughs> yeah. So he, so it was only, so you'd done the three and a half. Did you get offered any deals to give any the jewels back to get more time cut? Well, apparently, uh, well, when we was in court, um, we said that we had a debt with the gam um, gambling debt with the Russian mafia, and they they took the jewels. So um, and that was it, really. There wasn't no, no, there wasn't no real deals cut, and there wasn't gonna be. Um, mm -hmm. So. And that was that. that was so it. what what was like what was life like inside? I mean, you got to three and a half. You'd have got more respect, though, that you didn't turn queens. Yeah. Well, first of all, because it was national in the papers and stuff. Uh, when we went in, in a certain way, we were treated slightly different. You know, everyone's like bigging us up and stuff. Um, secondly, uh, where I was. Um, I was in Brixton and uh, it was 23 hour bangle, proper old school jail. Um, you'd only go downstairs to get your meals. And, you know, looking back, I'm glad it was like that because li further down the line when I got to my Cat D and stuff, because you heard stories, because uh, it was my first time. So I'd rather do it, doing it like that, tough, 
made me realise that one thing is I don't want to go back. Because um, I remember I did six months in Brixton, then I got out on bail, um, and that was, a, oh, mate, um, they really messed... Um, my uncle, who's a who's an accountant, he put my bail down. In them days, we're talking, he put his house down, half a million, yeah, and they messed him about. It took, you know... They really messed it. They didn't want to let me out, but they had to. Had to surrender my passport, sign, sign on at the police station every uh, week. Yeah, 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 yeah. Three times was it once a day? Yeah, because they, they thought these these kids gonna you know they're gonna do one. Mm-hmm. Um, but I remember the blessing was when I got out. Um, my missus was pregnant. We had we had a baby girl then, uh, so I got to see her being born. And then I went back to do what was the other uh, 12 months. Um, so it was a real blessing for me because it was my first child. I got to see a born. And then uh, I remember when I was inside and I remember getting a picture of her uh, when she, she must have been about eight months. And mate, I looked at because I had nothing else. You know, I didn't see no pictures of her, you know, hardly getting any phone calls. I remember looking at a picture. I've never think I've got a picture at home, and I remember looking at thinking, man, you know, that's priceless. What I've missed there, seeing her growing up. Um, so yeah, it was. I mean, when you're in prison, the way I look at it, you don't exist. Yeah, you know, I've had friends who have been in prison. They've lost their fathers, their mums, their brothers, and uh, luckily for me, touch wood, nothing like that happened to me. But it did happen uh, with one of my friends and. It's, mate, you, you're helpless. Something happens at home. There's nothing you can do. Yeah. You know? Your life's took away. Yeah. But again, you do the, you do the crime, you do the time. It's so cheesy well, that, as it is. It is, mate. It is, yeah. but, you know. Was that a wake-up call for you then? Because I've had, I've been to many funerals and I've had family members coming in handcuffs. Yeah, yeah, mate. Yeah, yeah. Try yeah. To, uh, well, look, you know, coming from my background, of, like <clears> with my parents, you know, my dad just working, never, mate. He didn't even get a parking ticket. Gentle giant, uh, God rest his soul. I lost him 10 years ago. Sorry to hear that. Yeah. <laughs> Listen to this, right? So when he when he passed away, right? Um, well, first of all, what had happened is uh, when they raided my house, yeah, um, when they come uh, at the beginning, I think, like, there was about 20 of them, mate. They went through everything. There's a suitcase there. It's my dad's, yeah? He, he used to work, he lived and worked in Denmark, a suitcase there, yeah? And they said, right, they're thinking, oh, this is it, yeah? So the goat was right. It's one of them, you know, them coded ones for your digits. They said, right, we're going to we're gonna smash this open. What's the code? So we ring my dad. Guess what the code was? 007, <laughs> yeah? Second thing is, when he passed away, the suitcase, that same suitcase, um, when I opened it, you know what he had in the he had my court papers and pictures, yeah. Because over the years, what had happened is when, when I went in, he was distraught. I remember the, the first time he come to see me in Brixton. This is, and uh, he was a gentle giant. He's never been to prison before, and he sees me, and he's like crying, mate. Oh man, he's heartbreaking. You know what I mean? I to hold it together. I said to him, look, Dad, don't come and see me here again. You know, it's a bit of a mission because you had to go from Manchester to London. And uh, the humiliation of probably, you know, when they're going through, they probably patted him down and stuff. He's never been through like that before. Mm-hmm. And um, it made me realise, man, you, I don't, you know, I put my family through a lot, you know. But at the same time, what happened is over time, when his friends and people who talked to him, they joked with him saying, listen, yeah, he did a crime, yeah. But trust me, it, it's, you know, read into it, it's quite funny. It's mm-hmm. quite comical. He didn't shoot anyone, you know, and mm-hmm. he didn't physically rob anyone. You know, I'm not trying to justify it, but yeah. do you know what I mean? Of course, but it's okay I was here telling a story and people are engrossed by stories like this. But again, there's always victims. Even the two people who got robbed, they could have potentially lost their jobs. They could have potentially have kids to feed as well. And do you know what I mean? So when you're doing a life yeah. of crime, it affects everyone. And if you're sitting in prison, even your dad, he's probably thinking... 
heartbroken at the way he's, he never thought he'd see his son in prison and that's for anybody watching maybe go down a life of crime or whatever that is the, the hard thing because when I interviewed Paul Ferris he says that when everybody walks away the hardest thing is seeing your family members walk through the door while you're still there and you can't do nothing yeah 100% mate I've got you know like I said I've got kids here and it mortify me you know I t- you know every time I you know, sit with them I tell them um, especially my two boys I say listen you know don't go down this way, you know, what I did was a long time ago, 21 years ago, James, I've not done anything since then, yeah, people think, you know, I'm still in the game, I mean, over the years, the amount of people that have approached me to do stuff, yeah, and I've said, no, you know, I did something, and I know there's people out there on social media messaging me and this and that, you know, saying, oh, he's glamorising it, I'm not, you know, I didn't ask Vice to make a, a documentary, they approached me, same with the film, same with the first documentary, The Art of Crime, which was on Channel 4, um, um, well, in Millennium. So if I can put one kid off, or even my kids off from going that way, then mm-hmm. I'm doing something right. And again, um, I've, I've been speaking, before this COVID situation, I was going to do some mentoring um, at schools. It's what, something that I really want to get into. I want to go into school, speak about my life, and tell them, tell these kids, look, you know, it's yeah. not what it's made out to be, mm-hmm. you know. How hard was it then to coming out? Obviously, your reputation becomes high. That enhances your criminal portfolio when you're doing heists like that. That's a turn on for every criminal in the sun that people are going to jail for robbing bookies and banks, maybe getting 30, 40 grand and doing 10 years. If you're doing turns for two and five million just by phone calls, that then you become a target for the underworld to get you involved. So how hard was it for you to make changes? Well, this is it. It is it's hard, mate. And still living in the same area, you know, people would, you know, approach approach me all the time. And it was just, no, you know. The first thing that happened, to be honest with you, when I came out, I, I came out of prison. I'm just settling into life. I mean, it's not like I did a major sentence. Uh, I've come out and I get approached by Channel 4. And I thought, is this a wind up? You know, because I've never, you know, you never heard of stuff like this. I got, I got approached by Channel Four, and I really did think it was a setup or something with some hoax. And um, they wanted to do the documentary, which was called The Art of Crime. So we went back and forth over a few months. I got my solicitor involved. I don't trust anyone, me, you know. Um, so I got involved in that straight away, pretty much a few months uh, from getting out. So. Uh, I mean, that went on for two years. And then, again, I was, uh, you know, carrying on with life, uh, doing work. And then I get approached by another production company, James. Every, you know, this was every few years. I'm like, right, okay, what's this about? Oh, right, we want to sign you up on a retainer. We want to make a film. So, like, right, okay, fine. Um, So they had me on another retainer for two years where I couldn't talk to anyone. Nothing materialised. And then, prodding along, what happens then? I get a phone call, and it's uh, some uh, TV series that's getting made in Manchester. Uh, with uh, do you remember Lock, Stock and Snatch? Yeah, yeah. yeah remember yeah. the black guy with the dreads with the jewelry shop? Yeah. Lenny James. Now he's he's massive in America now. There was a film around him based in prison. Uh, him and his brother, and they want some real life characters, so they go to me. Look. We've seen your documentary and you uh, must have liked something about me. I said, we want you to be in it. I'm like, me in what? I'm not an actor. They go, listen, trust me, you know, it's fine. And then I'm going there and then I'm meeting Lenny James and I'm looking at him thinking, wow, you know, actor and all that. And he's looking at me thinking, wow, real life criminal. And I'm thinking, what am I doing here? You know, uh, I did that. Even when a BAFTA, it was called... Uh, Buried, it was a six-part series, I was in that, in bits, you know, it wasn't like it was a major role, and I'll tell you one thing, I think it was uh, episode four, it's a scene where I've had to, we're in the gym together, yeah, and I've had to um, snatch, uh, it was over drugs, I've had to argue with him, and uh, there's like four cameras, two on him, two on me, me, I was like, I started sweating, I was fluffing my lines a bit, yeah, I'll be honest with you, because again, like I said, I might be a blagger, but I'm not an actor. Mm-hmm. Um, 
So uh, I remember him, you know, he said, you know, took me to the side, listen, just you know, relax, you know, just just say the lines, and 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 we did, and you know, um, so the experiences of my life, I've come out of prison, yeah, um, and then things are just started to happen, and then they died of died of death, and mm -hmm. you know, I was, I was working, I was having more kids, um, I've had a few marriages, mate. You know, <laughs> How many? Yeah. Um, I'm on my fifth now. <laughs> yeah. 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 People say, I, they, I yeah. think I must like wedding cake. <laughs> you know, um, yeah. yeah, I'm on my, I'm on my fifth. Fuck's sake, fifth time my charm. Yeah, mate, uh, yeah, uh, and, uh, um, and we've got, we've got a little baby. On How many way. kids you got? Uh, kids, um, this will be the seventh. How many different women? Uh, three different women. You're as bad as me, mate. <laughs> you're, you're my hero. <laughs> yeah, but life, no matter what your life is, no matter what you've done, you can get opportunities, good or bad, no matter what you've done in the past, you can, you always opportunities present themselves. It's, it's how you want to take out those opportunities, what you want to take, whether it's good or bad. It's all down to the individual. Now, it's difficult, especially coming out of prison. How do you think now... That two million heist, two million five million pound heist that you've done to now, do you think it could be done as easy, if not easier now? Or well, do you think there'd be folk, like video calls and no, stuff? No, I think the see you hear stories. You know, someone's pressed a button, sent five million somewhere, yeah. But it's not money, money. You know, it's in a bank somewhere. You know, it's a paper trail. You know, and with CCTV and proceeds of crime and everything else. I think, to be honest with you, um, obviously I've, I've, I've been out of the game 20 years, but you hear stories, but I think it's, in some ways it's, it's harder, but then when I look back uh, with our heist, you know, every little thing we had to do ourselves. So uh, with technology, it was harder then as well. So it's... Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you ever think about that? Think about stuff like that how you could like oceans 11 and think yeah these are kind of that's doable does it catch still me if you, catch yeah me if you can. because let's face it when you're when you're trying to be good in life as boring like oh mate uh, well this is you know what i think this is why i've never but it's really... easier it's easier there's not pressure where you need to look for cid or you need to look for the police everywhere or you're not you have to change phones or you're talking in fucking lingo and but as you do think I'll tell you what James I swear to God yeah I sleep well at night yeah you know because I know I'm not doing nothing wrong yeah. now yeah that's the the good side of it the bad side is pr probably because I've been through so many marriages probably because I've never really settled because I've always been torn of having this gl glamorous lifestyle to what I'm you know working and being the good dad the good um, I was going to say good husband, but uh, <laughs> better not say that yeah, one. Yeah, you can put that in the same yeah, part as yeah. your, but, your, um, your so, robberies. Yeah, I, you know what? I, I, mean, I see something, we, what you said, uh, what I watched the other day, my attention span is very small, yeah, you know, and uh, I do find it hard to settle. Um, and I blame it on the life that I, I had. Trust issues. Yeah, tr yeah, trust issues, yeah. I'd say trust issues. And I always think, I'll, look, I'm very close to my kids, yeah. Um, I like to think so anyway. And I look at them and, you know, I just think, is this... It's like me talking with you now, me being on Vice and documentaries of films, yeah. I, 100%, I, I don't know how it reflects on them, you know. I mean, my oldest daughter, she's uh, going to be... Mate, I've got four birthdays this month in mm -hmm. January. You better four. go out and fucking do another robbery, mate. mate. <laughs> I'm telling you now, four birthdays, yeah. <laughs> so I, I sometimes think, you know, how's, how's it... Because I've spoke to him about it, but mm -hmm. then I, think, I always think with the dad, they're never going to be... That, Fully honest. Yeah. Um, but I've always tried to explain what I did was obviously wrong. You don't want to go down that road. And I will do it going on forward, you know, going forward. You know, I mean, I've, I don't read the comments on uh, some of the interviews and whatever, but people flipping end up sending them, oh, have you seen this? Have you seen this? And it's like, you know, I mean, a lot of it's 
these good, yeah. Obviously, but a lot of it's bad. Um, and I think you don't you don't know me, yeah. You know, you're looking at this something that I did mm-hmm. twenty years ago, yeah. You know, since then, I'm a changed man. Yeah. You know? But don't look at the comments, people. Are Mate, I joke. I remember, edits. you know, listen. I remember I watched Joe Rogan. Yeah, mm-hmm. he used to be my favorite podcaster, but you are now. And uh, I remember he said that. You know, he was talking to uh, a UFC fight and he's saying, you never read the comments. Don't read the comments. Mm-hmm. And uh, I didn't, mate. It's when they get sent to you. But yeah. um, because I'm going to tr- yeah. make good of it. Yeah. You know what I mean? I'm going to make good But of yeah, it. that's the only thing you can do. And for your kids, there's nothing you can do. You can't change the past. It's who you were back then. And as we get older, we kind of come softer and more vulnerable. And then you think about everything you because when you're in a life of crime you're selfish as fuck you don't care who you're hurting oh, what you're doing yeah. you just want to make an earner to go and waste it and live a, a, a fake lifestyle but when you start getting older and you start trying to change and make better decisions you understand that it's how fucking deluded we were to when you go back to the past and think what you'd have done for money it's scary everybody yeah. would have got fucked over nobody's there's no loyalty even yeah, though yeah. that man stuck you in at court, we're always wanting that bit extra. We're always wanting that bit more. It's just greed. It's yeah, just constant yeah. greed. And But the fact that you've come out and you're still trying to create a positive life and stayed out of trouble, stayed out of prison, that's the difficult thing, especially when you're seeing a picture of your kid. If that doesn't want to make you change your life, then fucking nothing will. Mate. Do you know what I mean? So what's the plans for you now then? You going to try and get a book, film? Uh, well, look, if anyone's out there is interested in the book, because uh, we've done two documentaries, done a feature film. I think there's another film, because uh, the film that was made, Plastic, really what they did was they glamorised it, you know, made it to Hollywood, and they only incorporated the heist at the end. Um, so I think really, if I mean, if you sit down with me, there's more to me than just the heist, just... Yeah throwing the five marriages to uh, one of the marriages was a multiracial marriage you know um and that was um that was well it, to be honest with you i i messed up there i didn't know how to handle it you know because um i'm a british born pakistani you know um I've, i'm quite um let's say a modern uh british born but at the same time i've got certain asian values you know or ways, should I say. And um, the girl, um, she was my second wife, just in case if you're thinking. Um, she was uh, she was from a little place in Merseyside called Liso. And uh, when we got together, it was, um, I'd, I left my first wife and my daughter. So they'd, they'd left the country and uh, me and Lisa, uh, we went on and got married. But I was a bit traumatised because my daughter had left the country and um, it affected our marriage, obviously. Uh, obviously. What's happened is we were trying for a baby and uh, at that time she uh, we got checked out, but she needed horm- hormone treatment. And um, I, mean, I can talk about it now because I think she knows deep down. Um, it, I ended up splitting up with her because I panicked. I'm thinking, wait, I've lost my daughter, she's gone. Now, I don't know when I'm going to see her. And the girl that I'm with that I love, maybe not be able to have kids. And I panicked, which was wrong. And uh, I split up. Well, we split up. And uh, when, from then, I'm here now, basically. Yeah. But so I, there's, th- yeah. what I'm saying is, to my life, there's been so many different things. Of course. You know, um, and uh, with, with, with the film, uh, Plastic, it was... Um, it, that that was another crazy thing, mate. You know, again, from years of just just carrying on doing me thing, yeah. And uh, I was go- I used to go to a gym uh, just not far from here, and uh, it's a bit of an exclusive gym, and you, you had a lot of rich housewives, you know? <laughs> and uh, one of them, her um, brother-in-law, owned this film company, Gateway Films. They made films like. 
the Essex boys, uh, Rise of the Foot Soldier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, them Rise of the Foot Soldier, there's one, two, three, four, five. <laughs> there's, about there's, about, 10, yeah. there's about as many as yeah. them as my wives. <laughs> so, yeah. mate, they've, they've, they've milked that one. <laughs> you so, can Rise of the Prince, mate, part yeah, five with exactly. you and your wives. <laughs> so, uh, what's happened is, uh, she was uh, uh, one of my best friends with personal training, uh, and uh, he's come to me and said, listen, Saki, goes... Because this guy wants to talk to you from London and uh, regarding a film. And this is like we're talking 2000 and around about 10, yeah? So it's about six, seven years after the other things, the documentary and uh, the series with Buried. So, because at that time I thought, this is done, you know, my thing's done now. And I have never, again, chased anyone else to say, hey, look, can, you know, would you like to do this on my life? So... This guy wants to meet up, so I've said to him, go, right, I'll tell you what, tell him to come to the Lowry, yeah? If anything, we'll get a nice meal out of it. That's all I'm thinking. I'm thinking it's probably nothing. So I met up with him. The name was Chris Howard. And um, they said, look, we want to make a film. We want to make a film about... about we've seen your documentary and uh, we want to make a film about, about your heist. So me being a blackhead that I am, I just thought, right, OK. You know, they said, right, we'll give you this, 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 or, and we'll do this, this, this. And I said, no, I've just gone for, like, way over the odds. And what's happened is he's turned around and he goes, I've got to make a phone call. He's on the phone, I'm thinking, what? to myself, I'm thinking, what the fuck have you done here? You know, it's not like you've got everyone knocking your door down for mm -hmm. this now. So he goes, look, he goes, I can't sanction this. I'm going to have to go away, speak to you our partners, and uh, they went away. And uh, I remember him saying to me, we'll get you free tickets for the premiere. I go, mate, that won't even cover my kids. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Ended up giving me 20 tickets, flew me to Miami, uh, business yeah. class with me and, uh, me and the ex-wife at the time. And um, we made this film. It was based, based in Miami because they wanted to do Vegas, but because it's... Been, Vegas had been overkilled with yeah, the yeah. Oceans 11 and stuff. And um, so, yeah, so I did that for two years. Film came out. Oh, before the film comes out, because it was made by a small British company, what's happened is Paramount Pictures have... Uh, took me up, mate. Uh, Paramount Pictures have... I've took it on, yeah? Mm -hmm. So they've invited us to the Paramount Studios, yeah? And it's me and these the two guys who own the film company, and we sat across this board. Yeah, we're talking ten, pe ten people. Yeah, and I'm sat there on this scene. I'm thinking, fuck me, what the fuck am I doing here? Paramount Studios. Yeah, they just made uh, uh, that film Noah with uh, Russell Crowe, mm -hmm. and uh, so they took it on, you know, to promote it and stuff. And uh, I remember the PR woman that they gave me. A um, few months before that, she she was running around for Russell Crowe, and now she's running around for me from Cheetah Mill. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's just like the experience is mad, mate. But doing stuff like that and having the past of that heist, it is a turn on for directors, publishers. Has nobody ever came forward to do your book? I'm surprised at that. You've no, not had no, any well, offers. I think, I think I think what it was is James because. The, the documentary came out, you know, the first thing that happened was the documentary. So maybe, because normally it's a book, film. Yeah. Mine was the other way around. You had this documentary and then um, um, I signed a couple of deals that didn't come about. And then obviously Plastic uh, came in 2012. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I don't, look, you never know. It might, it might come. It might yeah, not. it doesn't matter but if it's I, not I mean, I didn't day, you know, <clears throat> think... I mean, I've done numerous articles. We're talking from GQ to, you know, from your local newspaper to your national. Mm -hmm. um, so, see what happens. See, that's the thing, man. It's weird. Like, I always say it, but true crime does sell. Criminals are the, my biggest views. I could have the most, the biggest celebrity in the world, but I could have an unknown who's done um, some life of crime and it could be bigger. So people are intrigued by that kind of stuff. If you look at Netflix, all the top programs is true crime. 
Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, um, yeah it is. But the funny thing is, when even when you come out of prison, no matter your crime, there's an interest in it from yeah. directors, publishers, because, again, true crime sales. I never thought, when I, in them days, when I came out, you know, there wasn't really no social media and stuff, yeah. I told you when Channel 4 got in touch, I thought it was a wind-up, you know. Um, and it was unheard, especially from where I was from, it was unheard of a criminal coming out of prison, getting approached to talk about what he's done and stuff like that. And yeah. it happened. So what's the plans then for yourself? Over 20 years ago, you've done this heist. Now you're fifth marriage deep, seven kids. <laughs> Five kids, seven? No, no, six kids, six one kids. on the way. A lot, of, <laughs> a lot of people don't even know about the one on the way. Congratulations. Thank you, mate. Thank you. <laughs> so, yeah, life is a, as we all know, it's a, a roller coaster. So you've got another kid on the way. Your life's clean. What's the plans for the future kicking on? Plans for the future is uh, getting to mentoring with kids. I want to do, you know, I want, really want to help kids, not, especially where I live. You know, there's still a lot of crime, you know, and uh, if I can help any kids staying away from crime, that'd be a big thing. Um, definitely not get married again. <laughs> you know, that's me done. No more <laughs> wedding cakes, just birthday mm -hmm. cakes. And um, see what life brings. The main, I'm working. I've been working for a long while. I work, funny enough, I work in security. Um, <laughs> not credit card security. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, Case so... Casing the joint. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So... Um, um, How could you get a job in security with your past? Yeah, but because it was, uh, I mean... Over 10 was, years ago? Bro, it was 20 years ago. Yeah. You know, you can't be, you know, and um, it, look, you know, just remembered something. So I'm in Miami, yeah, for filming for Plastic. And what's happened is, uh, there's the first time I've gone back to America. I'm shitting it. I'm thinking, fuck, you know, Asian guy, yeah, with the past, yeah, you know what I mean? So what's happened is the took us in the... I knew it was going to happen. The took us in the back. Kept us in the back for five hours, yeah. So, so what's happened is interviewing us, what you're doing here, they're, 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 they're. I'm knackered, mate, yeah. Uh, eventually they let us go, yeah. Uh, as we're getting our stuff, um, I think I'd... Um, like a, a bum bag thing, yeah, with, with my stuff in, yeah. And... Uh, I've only forgot it at the airport, right? So I'm in America filming a film about credit card fraud. Some fuckers got my card, yeah? Started having a shopping spree. Mm -hmm. How ironic is that, yeah. mate? So I've had to get on the phone to my bank, yeah? Mm -hmm. Okay, oh, no, it's not me, you know, this and that. And I thought, wow, mm -hmm. how things turn yeah. around, mate. Yeah. I'm in America and someone's <laughs> banging... I'm making a film yeah. about credit card fraud and someone's banging out my Well, it's karma because I had big... Um, Elliot Castro on Scottish yeah, boy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Watch Again, he he done fraud and yeah, yeah. his card got done. Yeah, yeah. But again, in life, what goes around comes around exactly, as well. Mate. It's um, exactly. It's, I I believe everything is karma, yeah, and if you do yeah. good, you will attract good. Things do go wrong in your life just because if you're trying to do good, your life's great. You still yeah. have more problems, but you just handle them better. Yeah. More good does come your way. Yeah. It's um. Life is it's a fucking journey, but yeah, because I had Marilyn Wimsby on. Her dad was involved in the great bank, the great train robbery. Oh, yeah. So she was, and it was a post office, I think they'd done on it. it post office money, I think they'd done on the train. Or her dad was a robbed post offices, but she went for a job in a post office. She was actually trying to go legit, and, <laughs> and they, they looked at their forms, and obviously they did the checks, and they just like, ah, fuck off. <laughs> Over the years, what happened, you know, when we were doing credit cards, there was a time when I was on the phone to American Express and they asking me a load of questions, yeah. So I'm like, what's going on? Why are you asking me so much, so much questions? And she, she was telling us there's fraud being committed in the UK by... Because, um, like I said, one of us got caught uh, in uh, Holland and she asked me so many questions and I'm saying, well, what's going on? And, <clears throat> and she turned around... And she's telling me about me, you know. And um, I, when I got out, I, actually my solicitor got approached, you know, um, from American Express whether I was willing to work. And um, to be honest with you, I, I didn't go down that road. You know, maybe I should have, but at that time I thought no. Because 
you never know. You yeah. know what I mean? To work for them, to help them yeah, with yeah, fraud. Yeah. But yeah. that's difficult just coming out because then you're thinking you've yeah. got access yeah, yeah. before you know it, you're back inside. Well, yeah, yeah. And uh, I mean, and the other thing was the girl that I met at the beginning, you know, she was, she, no one ever found her either, mm-hmm. you know. Fair play if you're not turning queens on anybody. Fair play for just taking your, your sentence on the chin. You get more respect for that. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think. I think Do that's you know why, I mean? you know, in Cheat Mill, um, I mean, a lot of the time people that come up to me, you know, it's always good in the sense that, you know, you did what you did, you've done your time and uh, you crack on. Yeah. So hopefully you get a book out then, potential film. Life yeah. is going good at the moment. Yeah, you know, and anyone who's uh, interested in my story, watch the, yeah. the Vice. Watch your social media stuff for it's, people to uh, get in touch. Uh, SAC01 on Insta. Um, YouTube, it's Saqib Mumtaz if they want to see anything. And uh, Facebook, uh, the same, Saqib Mumtaz. What's it like for you when you walk by jewellers and stuff now? Do you look in jewellers and check prices still? Uh, I well, do that. Listen, yeah, look, I, I'm, I still love, you know, yeah. I like nice watches, you know, look of, you know, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? You've got a nice yeah. watch, you know, first thing I do. Yeah, I do. And you know what? It's funny you used to say that. I'm always, you, you never kind of like lose that. Or even in a sense, if I was, not, I don't do nothing wrong, but I feel like I've done something wrong as I'm driving down the road. And they, who the fuck's that? Yeah. You know, um, but because yeah. I do that with gambling, I had a gambling yeah, addiction. Yeah, so, I believe so when I listen to football results, I place when I know teams or boxing matches are coming up, yeah. I'll place bets in my head, yeah. and I and I, I don't know why I do it. Obviously, it's just old conditioning habits, and I'll place bets in my head. And sometimes the one I think, fuck. And it's crazy because that's how fast it is yeah. to, to slip back fast. Yeah, yeah. Well, you just mentioned gambling, you know. Um, we were, when we were kids, we were the first, like, young lads from, well, especially around Cheat Mill, that were going Vegas. No, you know, Vegas wasn't even big there. And we were going at the MGM. And um, obviously, we used to pay, pay, for, pay for it with what we've earned from, mm-hmm. obviously, credit card fraud. And... Um, one of one of my mates, he was he was a big gambler, and uh, we used to get comped. The MGM used to just give us a sweet, yeah. And long as you spent a certain number of hours on, yeah. the, on the table, and um, I mean and that's when we met Tupac and Will Smith, and you know, hang, hanging around with people like that. Mm-hmm. It's just like, you know, I mean, didn't have camera phones then. Yeah. Oh man. To show know. the evidence, yeah, because they were massive, and because that's where all the fights were. Tyson. Yeah, yeah, we Tupac, used to go. We yeah. used to go. We used to, uh, we watched a couple of Tyson fights, yeah, um, the one with uh, Frank Bruno, and I think it was Herbie Hyde, mm-hmm. and he got knocked down about six times. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, so we, we, we were living that life 20 years ago, mate, mm-hmm. you know, um, yeah. Vegas. Um, Do you miss it? Eh, uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, cause, you know, who wouldn't? You'd be a liar if you mate, said it, though, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, why wouldn't? It's the buzz. It's that buzz, Listen, like, you see all the people are active, maybe doing drugs and shit, and... Sometimes it's not the money, it's the buzz they think, it's the adrenaline kick. It's, it's weird the way some people think and, and it's hard for people to get out because there's a, a buzz there. And I've interviewed boxers as well, it's hard for them to retire because of the buzz, the adrenaline, the, the ring entrance and fighting. And it's hard to stop anything that's giving you an adrenaline yeah, kick. Yeah, definitely. Do you know what I mean? But you miss it. Yes, I do, man. Yeah, yes, I do. You know, I'd be lying if I said no. He's just even thinking back, you know, because he's bring, you know, this interview is bringing back, bringing it all back. Um, yeah, I do. That buzz is just, I mean, like yourself when when you when you're betting and a bet mm. comes in, that feeling, yeah. that rush you get. Yeah. Um, it's 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 mind. It's crazy how the mind works. It's just try to understand it when you try to become a better person. You're not hurting as much people. It's everybody around you who you destroy. Yeah. It's like your father coming up to prison, all your wives. <laughs> Do you know no, what I mean? You know what? So... I mean, I, I never, I never, well, there was only the one at the time, uh, but yeah. Cause but it obviously cause has I'm, an effect of. Of course it does. Of course you know it I mean? does. No stability. Yeah, yeah. Where no. everything becomes hectic and it. it's just as life goes on, we try and make changes, we try and better ourselves, but it can be difficult. But for te- coming on today and telling your story, mate, it's been fascinating, fair play. If for anybody watching, it's maybe. Looking for advice, it's maybe caught up in a life of crime. What advice would you give for them? Don't do it. Yeah, don't get caught. <laughs> don't do it, don't get caught. And think twice, you know, um, just think twice because 
like you said, the repercussions, jail, when you come out, f- find it difficult to get jobs, you know, it just carries on and on. Yeah. Um, so just don't do it. Um, it's, I'd say it's not worth it, but sometimes it can be. Yeah. Um, but, Did your dad see you changing your life? Yeah, because, again, you know, he, he died 10 years ago, so he seen me for 10 years. I came out and yeah. I was working, mate. I was mm-hmm. grafting, you know. Um, the thing we need is when I get my head down, you know, as you know, like today, I'm punctual. Anyone yeah. who knows me, if I say you're going to be here at a certain time, yeah. or if I'm working, I won't just phone in sick and, you know, I'll just work. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, no, he did. He did. I mean, don't get me wrong. You know, any time I went away, you know. Uh, he was worried. Yeah, yeah. And and you know what? I do it now with my lad, yeah, my oldest lad. I've got two. He's uh, coming on to 13. He's, he's getting into all his singing stuff, yeah. And... Uh, when he's out, so dad gonna go play football and that, and it brings back memories to way because me and my dad were very close, um, and I just think you know it's, it's that circle of life, isn't it? Yeah. You know, um, especially with all these knife crimes and everything else. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I worry for him, just like my dad used to worry for me. Yeah, you know? there's protection on it as parents. It's protection. Yeah. Would you like to finish up on anything, brother? Yeah. Well, look, if anyone's out there who's interested in. Uh, in a book deal or interested in uh, doing a film uh, get in touch get through yourself or through my social media um, and definitely if there's any schools out there after this COVID situation dies down I'd, I really want to get into uh, speaking in schools about what I've done and uh, how not to go this way yeah definitely I think people will get in touch because you speak very well you're clearly making changes to better your life you're clearly honest about your past which is a good thing and you're not a snitch, mate, which is um, there you go. which makes you a hundred percent, brother. But Sakib for coming on today Thank and you. telling your story. I really appreciate it. I genuinely wish you all the best for the future and your new baby coming. So yeah, hopefully this marriage stays strong and we're not sitting yeah. on a part two in next year and your well, marriage it. number ten. So yes, brother, thank you. Check out more of my podcasts on the right and be sure to like, share and comment your thoughts on this week's podcast. Thank you.